Welcome to the S2 Cognition Podcast. S2 is the official cognitive evaluation in sports, from youth to pro, where athletes and coaches build to win. Today, we are joined by Atlanta Falcons general manager, the man with a plan, Terry Fontenot. Terry is as down to earth as they come and is as humble of a person as I've ever met. We discuss him growing up in Louisiana and now working for the rivaled Atlanta Falcons. He also reveals how he balances subjective and objective data when evaluating players for the draft. Also, what set Drew Brees apart from other quarterbacks that were much more physically gifted than he? The importance of high-level cognition in successful NFL quarterbacks, and of course, the most impressive player he's ever seen in person. This is one of my favorite interviews I've ever done, and I hope you enjoy it too. Terry Fontenot on the S2 Cognition Podcast, next. We're really excited to get into this and talk cognition with the Falcons GM, man. Yeah, Terry. So, man, uh, we, we kind of all know your story going from intern all the way to general manager. But, but you know us Louisiana boys. I got to take it a little further back than that. Uh, tell, tell, me, tell me where you went to high school. Give me a little bit about your background, what sports you played, and, and all that sort of leading up to when you got an actual job. Yeah, so, so I grew up around some really good football, and, and it really shaped and, and developed my passion for the game where I grew up. Growing up in Lake Charles, Louisiana, um, McNeese State at that time, we're talking the mid to late 80s um, or early 90s. They had some really good football teams, and, and I really grew up watching them. And uh, Kerry Joseph, Adam Henry, um, Kavika Pittman, Zach Bronson, those are some really good players, even to the 80s. Uh, Stephen Starring, uh, Buford Jordan. Um, that was some really good football we can go out and watch on Saturdays. And me and my dad, and my m- my brothers, and um, our family, we'd go out and watch watch the Cowboys on Saturdays. And, and that was that was fun. That was exciting. And then into Lagrange, my high school. Um, again, really good football district, three five A. And and so when I'm younger, I uh, my sister was in the band, so I got to travel around with the team, and we go to all the games and. Again, some really good football. District 35A, you got Legron, Salford, Barb. Uh, you got all those really good Lafayette schools, Acadiana, Karen Crow, Como. Um, that was some good football. Uh, I remember going to uh, Baton Rouge um, for a playoff game and watching Warwick Dunn r- run circles around uh, Lagrange. Um, you know, watching Eddie Kennison and Washington Marion. And then once I was at Lagrange, uh, we played against some really good players. Kevin Falk playing quarterback. For uh, Karen Crow, they getting. I felt like they getting shotgun and they run right, and then <laughs> when you're on the right hash, you'd run left, and he just he just smoked everybody, and, and it, it was really cool. Um, so again, a lot of really good football. When I was actually a sophomore, we we're playing in the playoffs, and uh, we, we had a good team. We basically ran the we were wing T. We ran uh, Nebraska's offense, and so we threw the ball seven or eight times a game, and so. I was that diva receiver complaining about not getting the football. And, <laughs> um, and, and then our we had a really – everybody played both ways. We had a very simple defense, and we just ran around and hit people and ran the same coverage. But we had a good football team. So we're in the the, the second round of the playoffs. We're up in Destrehan, and and we're, we're having a good game. We end up winning the game. I think we won by a couple of touchdowns. Our quarterback – was a guy named Russell Bond who was really hard on himself. And, and he's just one of the hardest workers I've ever been around. So he's down after the game, and I'm trying to give him a pep talk because he threw a couple interceptions, and um, they had some guy in the secondary that was had a good game against us. So Russell was down about it, and this guy was number 20. He ended up committing to Miami and uh, ended up getting drafted by the Baltimore Ravens. So um, And uh, he ended up going to the Hall of Fame, Ed Reed. So yeah, he, he yeah. was a pretty good player. <laughs> yeah. and, all right, a, man. <laughs> throwing a couple of interceptions to Ed Reed probably is okay. He's probably the best safety to ever play the game. But, but I, I got to grow up around a lot of really good football um, in, in the area, and it and it really kind of shaped my passion for the game. That's so cool, man. Yeah, going to St. Thomas More, um, you know, it was like fifty percent of the the roster played football in college at you know USL or Tulane or LSU. So it was just kind of it kind of felt expected 
And then, you know, living here in Nashville, it's like maybe one kid from the entirety of Nashville is going D1. Uh, so it's just some really <laughs> special football, uh, you know, down there and growing up there. And so you played defensive back, right? And then, and then the next step was on the two lane. Yeah, yeah. So I played uh, both ways at Lagrange and, and and played really corner and receiver. And then I got to Tulane, and I moved to safety. And it was funny; my head was kind of spinning when I got to Tulane because we ran. We were like Seattle's defense before Seattle at at, at Lagrange. We ran straight cover three. We just had a couple coverages, and we just played faster and physical, more physical than everybody else. We flew around and hit. And so when I got to Tulane, I had to learn all kind of different coverages and stuff, moving to safety, and my head was spinning, man. I just wanted to run around and hit people. <laughs> so, man, playing defensive back, clearly you played at a high level, right? I mean, you, you went to Division One football. Uh, does it does it shape or change the way that you actually scout defensive backs? Do, do you view that yeah, in a different it, lens being your position? You know, I think when you play at a position – it makes you, for me, I really enjoy watching the position. I, 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 I like doing it. And you kind of catch yourself where you need to be in evaluation mode. You catch yourself just watching and enjoying watching the players. Uh, but d- defensive back is such a unique position, whether you're talking about corner or safety, because they all just depend on what you're asking the players to do. And, and really, at every position, it's like that. But, man, you got to be in tune with your coaches on exactly what you're looking for because there's so many different flavors and and whether you're looking for a big long physical player that it's not as important to play off man coverage for example or you're looking for more of a press bail um heavy zone uh with any defensive back you need to be able to cover play the ball and tackle okay that's that's simple i think i heard nick saban say that one time three things you got to be able to cover play the ball and tackle okay and and, and so that's (laughs) But the, the tough thing about it is, is, is look, there's not many guys that can do everything and, and do it all to a certain level. So you have to really pick your poise and know what you're looking for and know what's most important to your coaches and what's most important in your scheme and focus on those areas. But it, it, it's fun. Um, I, I enjoy doing it. I really enjoy evaluating. I love looking at players in the secondary, but you, you better be in tune with your coaches and, and what you're asking that player to do. Yeah, for sure. DBs, as you as you well know, for S two wise, it's the second smartest, second fastest thinker on the field outside of the quarterback position. So, growing up in Louisiana, I'm going to assume you were a Saints fan. It would be the the Oilers would be the only other option, but I'm going to assume you were a Saints fan. No, you're a smart guy. Your assumption is wrong. I'm not going to tell you. My dad used to write down assume and and underline stuff and tell you what happens <laughs> when you assume. So, I'm not going to do that. But, clean podcast, but, Terry. Clean podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want the little but, E next to our podcast. Let's keep it real. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, uh, you are a smart guy because I was a huge Houston Oilers fan. Oilers it, fan. it was a big deal. Now, uh, again, my dad, he was all local. So it was it was the McNeese State Cowboys. It was the Bronze Gators and it was the New Orleans Saints. For me, I was a huge Oilers fan. And, you know, we're right there in southwest Louisiana, so we're on the border of Texas. Yeah. And so it's probably quicker to get to Houston than it is even to get to New Orleans. And, man, I was obsessed with Warren Moon, uh, that run-and-shoot offense, uh, Haywood Jeffries, Curtis Duncan, Lorenzo White, um, Blaine Bishop. Uh, We actually have a couple coaches on our staff right now, Frank Bush. um, We have coaches that played. Uh, on that the Houston Oilers teams in the the early to, to mid '90s, and those are some good football teams, man. I love watching the Oilers. I lived and died with them when they lost to Buffalo on uh, that playoff game. I, I told Frank Wright I was um, speaking at something with Frank Wright the other day, and I told him I said that was the worst day of my life, man. You, you kind of ruined. <laughs> I, I don't know how old I was, but I was depressed. Um, that was tough, but but I was a big time Houston Oilers fan, man. That's right, but but ultimately ended up spending a good a good amount of years with the New Orleans Saints organization, um, which at which where you were a part of some really really special some special teams. Growing up in Lafayette, uh, yeah, anything west of us, it was dangerous territory because you had the Astros, which was everybody's only choice to root for. But anybody west <laughs> of Lafayette, the Oilers kind of crept in, especially during those Earl Campbell years. Um, yeah, and so spent your time with some really special teams in the New Orleans organization. And then 
you know, growing up as a Saints fan, your bitter, my bitter rival has always been the, 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 the Falcons, right? The Dirty Birds. Uh, what was that transition like, man, going from the Saints organization to the, to the Falcons where there's just so much, such a rich rivalry there? It's, it's really interesting because I, I would say when I was on the other side of it, I would say, OK, th- th- this is something that would never happen. I never even considered it. And, and, and things kind of happen fast and, and it's, you can't even perceive it unless you're, you're, you're in it and you're, you're in the moment. But when I tell you, when I accepted this job and got this job for me and my family, it was instant. It was, it's like, once you, once you make that transition, it's instant. And, and I was all about the Falcons. And then especially once you get here and, and get involved, um, in the community and, and, and my kids from going to school to playing sports, once they really get ingrained, it's it's home and it's all about the people. And, and you're always trying to be a good teammate and do everything you can um, for the people around you. So once you transition, man, it's instant. And I, I don't even know how to explain it because I, I, I was I was the same way. I was just like you, 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 you know, when you're in New Orleans, um, you, you, you hate all the other teams in your division. But, man, once I get here. It's I'm all about the Falcons and and all about this team and this community and, and just want to work as hard as you possibly can to to win as many games as you can, win as many championships as you can. So, it, Brandon, I really can't explain exactly how it happened, man. I don't know if it's magic or what, but um, it, it was instant. No, I get it. I get it. I ran for the University of Tennessee, which, uh, as you know, comes with hating all other SEC schools and. As soon as my son went through the recruiting process and, you know, there's Arkansas and there's Alabama, I'm like, you mean to tell me I'm going to have to wear a crimson? There's no way in hell. But you just kind of get in that groove. And thankfully, he's at an ACC school at North Carolina State, but I have instantly become a North Carolina State fan, like overnight. So I, I totally get it. Totally get it. That's how it happens. Yeah. So, Terry, you're one of 32 people in the world that's a GM in the NFL. How do you prioritize, you know, time, allocation, family, job? H- how do you do all that? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. And I'm still trying to figure that out. I, I, I would say it's an it's an ongoing process. W- what I do do is I used to look at it like priorities and I would stack my priorities. So I would say, OK, your faith, your family, then football. And I would see them like a vertical stack, just like you're stacking magnets on a draft board. I would stack them like that and say, OK, I need to prioritize those things. But that doesn't work. And it, and it doesn't really make sense when you really think about it, because there's a lot of times that um, I'm putting my profession first if I can't do this or can't do that. So the more and more I went through and I might have read it in the book, someone might have told me, but now I look at it like a circle. And so I have this circle and and everything's intertwined there. And, and now my faith is at the center of it and my family's at the center of it. And but everything just has to be intertwined. And, and so I feel like your family has to be a part of what you do. Your faith has to be a part of what you do. So little things that, that we do, we I make sure that we live within 15 to 20 minutes of the facility. Um, some people like to live further to kind of decompress, and but we like to live really close. So I can, I'm can i 10 or 15 minutes from the schools, the baseball parks, the house, so I can be involved as much as possible. So my wife can drop the kids off at the facility as much as possible. Having four kids... And they like to be around, especially my 10 year old son. So mm-hmm. they're around the facility a lot. I make sure I'm as involved uh, as I can be. And th- the number one thing is you have to have the right significant other. And, and, and that's a that's a non-negotiable. If you don't have the right significant other, it, it can't work. And so um, I do I have a wife that, that does a great job keeping me involved and, and, and keeping the kids around as much as possible. And when I'm not around, explain to them um, what dad's doing. But um it's an ongoing process for me, but I feel like everything just has to be intertwined. Well, I may be asking you for some uh, recommendations. I just had uh, I just had a boy uh, just a couple weeks ago, so I may be looking to wow. you some for some advice and timing of everything, man. Congratulations, man! I appreciate that. So that's awesome, man. That's outstanding. Are you waking up at night? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We're waking. We're getting better. We're sleeping through the night. We're about two months in. Uh, he came. April 25th. So three days before the draft and I'm answering all these questions. Wow. I'm like, dude, you got to come. We got to get back home. I got work to do. 
That's awesome, man. Congratulations. Oh, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, player evaluation in the NFL is so multidimensional. Brandon and I and Scott have talked about it a lot on this podcast, right? There's a physical trait. You got to have the physical capabilities to play. You got to have the technical skills, the leadership, the work ethic, all these things we talk about. And now this piece that S2 brings, right? This, this processing, athletes process really quickly. How helpful has it been to get deeper insights into those processing skills uh, and access to that, that information from players? Yeah, it, it's, it's so critical because you're right. You have all these levels of, uh, of layers of information and, and it, it's critical to go through every process and, and gather as much information as you can. But when you get into that area, that's something that you can't just see. You, you can't just physically measure it like you time or 40 or you do. And so for so long, we're trying to figure out how can we measure this and how can we um, how can we measure instincts and that cognitive ability to make those split second decisions. And so um, being able to do that, and that's a critical part of what we do. Um, so being able to do that um, is and being able to see that information and, and to have data, not just from um, on, on this draft class or this free agency class or this football team, but have um, a lot of data to look at and to study. I, I think that's critical. That's critical. Yeah, we asked this question to Kirk Cousins, who was on our podcast just a couple weeks ago to talk about the process and how quarterbacks and all the things and demands that they have to do pre-snap, post-snap, seeing windows, distractions, the ability to improvise. So how well does our evaluation capture the split second decisions and speed of the game? Yeah, it's again, it's one of those things that it's to, to be able to capture that it is invaluable. And I, I think there's there's really no other way to do it. I, I, I don't know. Um, we have a lot of scouts that work really hard. What they do, a lot of coaches that work really hard um, and, and going through the evaluation process. And, and we work out players and we test players and we do so many things. Um, but we all have limitations on what we can do. So whatever information that, that we can get um, to, uh, to, to, to be able to see those things and because we're all trying to anticipate and predict what players are going to do once they get to this level. We've seen what they've done in college, but we have to try to predict what they can do under different circumstances. So, again, just getting, um, getting that information, it, it's invaluable to us. It's interesting. You, you just mentioned something there, the subjective data that comes with drafting, you know, that scouts have and experts have and things innate things that they just subjectively measure plus you have the objective measures that you get right hand size 40 all these things that you can objectively look at and say yeah we we know these things how how do you weigh those those two different types of um, subjective and objective data points yeah it's it's so you i don't think we'll ever be able to just gather all the data and, and, and gather all the measurements and put it in a computer and just spit out, um, okay, th- these are, uh, th- this is the profile of this player, this is how we see him. I think you have to have that, that human element to it. And, and that's why scouts are so important. And, and they go through their process and, and, and gather all the information, but there is a human element to what we do. It's an art, it's a science. Um, and, and there's there's all this information, but there is truly a human element to it um, because we can say we can test the player's physical traits. We can test his his IQ, his cognitive ability. We can test all these factors, but also th- there's a there's a part to it that that we can't quite test. And that's that human element. And you have to have boots on the ground, scouts gathering all that information. And, and when we're in the draft room. And we're going through the process, and sometimes the most important, or, or most times, the most important person to talk to is that area scout, the scout that has known this player from when he committed to that school, and he's been in and out of the school, and he knows every single piece of it, um, of the information. And I feel like sometimes as humans, we can't, we can't even process all the information we have, and so when there is an intuition, there is a gut feeling on a player then you have to trust that if a scout really likes a player or or, or really doesn't like a player. And even if they can't quite explain it, so we get all the data, we've got all the information and you've got the reports, 
we've gone through the, the, the process and, and, and met about the player and watched film. We've done everything. And, and if someone has a gut feeling, um, either way, especially that area scout that's been there so long, um, you, you have to put a lot of weight on that. And, and that's important to wait. Uh, so there is a, a human element to it. And I don't think that will ever change. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Terry. I mean, that's a that's a huge part of, I think it's very easy for the millions of armchair GMs out there to say, how could you miss on this player? How could you do that? But th- that's, we will, you know, we've been trying to predict human behavior since the beginning of time. And it turns out we're not very good at it. You cannot predict human behavior, especially in a dynamic situation um, where you don't know how someone's going to react, right? And so I think- yep. These scouts are, I think the scouting world is highly, highly undervalued in some respects because there's no substitute for the catalog of thousands of hours of watching football, watching a particular, like you pointed out, like a particular player. I mean, he could have watched this kid since high school, knows knows him better than any sort of draft board or anything like that. And, you know, I think it's easy to what we're finding anyway is it's easy to miss on the guys that are not these prototypical, like how could you not take this quarterback? He's six, five and has a rifle for an arm. He looks like Peyton Manning in every way, shape or form. How could you not take this guy? And I think there's just so much more to the story that these, that we're not getting right. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. And and when you have, uh, th- th- there's so many variables in, in in every part of of every player's story along the way, and when you think about some of the players that you you really hit on, sometimes it was that scout knowing the entire story and knowing exactly what was going on with that player and knowing why he didn't play particularly well in this specific year. Sometimes it's as simple as an injury or a or a position switch or. But sometimes it's a lot deeper. Sometimes there's there, there's some personal issues that a player's working through that that, that scout um, knew all about and, and our coach helped them out with. And um, but there's so many variables, like you say, in human behavior. Um, and so we, we can't just put it in a computer and spit it out. We, we have to have um, real humans doing the work. Right. It'd be real nice if you could, though, right? <laughs> oh, that'd be outstanding. I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't have a job if we could do that, though. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You need the human <laughs> element. You're a good dude, man. You got to have the good dudes. Um, you got to watch a Hall of Fame quarterback for a really, really long time, up close and personal, who can just process with the best of them and execute those decisions. And, and Brandon actually just wrote an article about the separators from quarterbacks at the highest level between cognition and other things that – you know, as we've talked about the multifactorial success of quarterbacks, he just wrote an article to this. What do you think are some of the decision-making separators at the highest level that you see or that you have seen? Yeah, and that's – Drew's the perfect example because you take Drew and he's not – he's below prototype height. Um, you would say his arm strength, he, he's not on the upper echelon in terms of just pure um, velocity or, or, or arm strength or how hard he throws the football. And so he's not going to be at the top of those those physical um, categories. And yet he was one of the best uh, to ever play the game. And the, the way he raised the level of players around him is is just rare. And so having a guy like Drew, it's it shows that how that the cognitive part of it, his 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 football intellect, his football IQ. And, and, and again, the decision making part, because for any when you're evaluating quarterback, the decision making part is critical now what makes it difficult um did he make a good decision or not that's hard for a scout to say how do you know on that play if he made a good decision or not how how do you know what (laughs) he's being coached to do how do you know what the coaches are telling him to do how do you know what um what he thought he saw or what it's a it's tough to say is he a good decision maker it's it's our job as scouts to do that but that's difficult to do now uh, you take a guy like drew Brees, and and he had all those factors i mean Above the neck, um, we know how how much he excelled. But when we talk about the other factors and we talk about evaluating human beings, what's made Drew so special outside of that is is the way he prepares and the grit and and the leadership and the determination 
and the way he handles adversity uh, because it's not always you look at him in San Diego. It wasn't perfect early on and there were a lot of factors, but it wasn't perfect. He had to bounce back. He had to handle some adversity and, and that's what, what made him so special. So that's why, like we say, we can never put it in a computer because even if we say his cognitive ability is at this point, okay, we have to piece it together with the person, with the makeup, with the character, with the work ethic, with all those things. Um, because you can have a, a player that has everything, but he's just not in an ideal situation in terms of the team at that time. There's just so many different factors we have to look at. But, but Drew um, was special in all those categories. I just want to take a real se- a quick second to point out something that you said that I don't think the general football fan understands. Just because a, a touchdown is made or just because there's a big play doesn't mean it was a good decision. And I think that we try to we try to quantify people as good decision makers or bad decision makers based on the result. And it's a huge mistake. I think there's a lot of quarterbacks out there, you know, that it, it doesn't really hurt anybody on the inverse. But when we when we classify somebody as a bad decision maker, um, we're only looking at the result, which could be for a ton of different reasons. At the quarterback position, it could have been because the receiver ran ran the wrong route. Could be because the offensive line is terrible. Uh, you know, I mean, there's so many factors, but I think that's a really, really good point, Terry. Um, is it, that you're, you're right, Brandon? And, and and really, that's one thing we we do in Atlanta. I think we do a really good job of is we spend a lot of time with our coaches, watching watching film with our coaches and discussing because you're evaluating a safety, you should probably spend some time with, with Dean Pease and, and, and Hoke. And, um, and, and, and again, when you're um, going through the process of evaluating quarterbacks and you want to watch film with, with Arthur Smith and Dave Ragone and, and, and Charles London, because it's critical, just what you said, and it's hard. It, 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 it's a challenge um, because you can't just look at statistics and look at the result of the play and, and think that, okay, it was a good decision, like you said, or th- th- this player is a good decision maker or they're, they're doing the right things. And you, you really need to know, you need to understand the defense, understand the scheme, um, spend time with that player, understand what he was thinking. Um, and, and, and that's why we can't just look at stats and say, okay, let's just take the, the, the players that have the best statistics um, because there are so many um, variables involved and there's a lot of peop- smart people um around it and you, you need to make sure you surround yourself with those people and try to understand it as much as you can. Yeah. There's a lot of decisions I think that are not captured by results or statistics um, that can make or break a game, you know, really. Yeah. And so certainly the, the cognitive demands differ across all positions in football. Uh, I'm curious if you think that there are positions that may need more or less cognition because we've heard, you know, some coaches, let's just use defensive ends, for example. Well, if they're physically gifted and they're big enough and they play in scheme, right. And they're physical enough, they can be disruptive. They don't really need cognition, but then you see (laughs) Miles Garrett and Joey Bosa, TJ Watt, those guys are scored off the charts. They're elite when it comes to processing, you know, it's kind of icing on the cake. I'm curious as to your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, you want, all your players to be really instinctive players and, 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 and to be able to problem solve on the field. You want that for all your players at every position, but I would say it is true when you think right down the middle, uh, you think quarterback, center, uh, middle linebacker, safety, the, the players that are, uh, depending on the scheme, are having to make a lot of decisions and having to, to make IDs and having to communicate on the field. And so if it depends on what you're asking that player to do and and sometimes a, a center or, or a middle linebacker could have a lot more on their plate depending on the scheme they're playing in. So if if there are those players that, that are relied on to have all those responsibilities, then they do need to be at a different level. And again, we talk about the corner position or the defensive end position, the, the, the receiver position. It really depends on what they're being asked to do. Um, You can take in in some schemes, receivers have to have a multitude of, they can get to the line of scrimmage and have three or four plays in their head. And um, depending on the coverage they read, they could have to make adjustments where some receivers, you know, at LeGrange High School, it was, you had one route 
and you had to go out there and run that route, man, that was it. That's all you had to worry about. So it was a little different. <laughs> but it, it really depends on the specific schemes. But if you do have a lot on your plate, again, being right down the middle of the field, um, I, I think it could be different. But ultimately, you want all your players. There's not a coach uh, that's going to say that they're okay with the player not um, being highly instinctive. And um, so, so you want all your players to be at a certain level, ideally. Yeah, and that's something I learned from you at New Orleans. Uh, talking, I took away from 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 a very long time ago. Especially, I think it, it might just be the organization in general, but the way you used to describe that we have to have a vision for every particular position or what we're looking for at that position. Um, and it doesn't, you know, it's it's really easy to get to get allured by the the biggest name on the board or the biggest name on the roster, but having a particular vision for that particular spot just really struck with me how well you always were looking um, at all pieces to fit a particular vision. And I think, you know, that's what made, has made you so successful. Yeah, that that's the most critical thing I would say. Um, having that that vision and, and working along with the coaches and knowing what they need um, th- that's what a what a scout's job is to do: get the coaches what they need um, to, to 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 be successful. And so you have to be on the same page and understand that uh, all these players, everyone's not going to be perfect. I remember when Dennis Allen came back to New Orleans. Um, he had been in uh, his prior stops were were Denver, and he had been in Oakland. And he comes back to New Orleans, and we're talking about a Sam linebacker. And he said, well, I had Vaughn Miller, then I had Khalil Mack. So that's what we're looking for. <laughs> and <it's, laughs> and, okay. And, it, and, it, and, and there's only now? two of them. Yeah. <laughs> and there's only two of them. But, but in right. doing that, that's when you have to sit down and say, okay, we got it. We're not going to um, – Khalil Mack's and Vaughn Miller's don't grow on trees. So what are the, the critical factors at this position that we need? What are the non-negotiables? at this particular position. And it's the same when we're talking to Dean Pease about safeties. He's coached some really good safeties. I mean, you can't say exactly what Ed Reed, and and it's hard to find another Ed Reed. He's coached some great safeties, but he can say, okay, these are the most important things in our scheme for this position. Um, and, And so you have that clear vision of what you're looking for. And then when you're bringing players in, you know that, hey, this is, their expectation and this is what we're trying to get them to. Yeah, it's interesting. You 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 talked about right the center of the field positions and you know, you you obviously want to take players across the board that have good cognition and that fit your scheme. AJ Terrell is a guy that has unbelievable ability to process information. He executes rapid decision making as well as anybody that that we've seen. When you watch him play, how, how does this unfold in his play? He's a he's a stud, and and you know we actually did an event with him this off season. He he was doing some cleanup in, in in his community, and so it was cool to get to get around his family, see where he grew up. He's got a little brother that's already a stud. Write it down. He's going to be a beast, and his right. his dad still looks like he could play running back in the NFL. So he's got a bloodline, and he has all those physical traits. He's tall. He's fast. He's athletic. He has all those traits, and. And, and again, you talk about decision making and the way he processes and and um, all, all those areas he excels in. And and the, the best thing about him is is the way he works, the way he prepares, um, the, the, the way he details everything he does. So having coaches like like Dean and Hoke and uh, he, he's going to get the most of his ability and, and he's he's going to continue to improve, just like we say, putting all those pieces together together. Um, not just having the having it between the ears and, and having it the physical traits, man, he's a worker, and, and I think that's what what makes him really special. Yeah, you talked about this earlier in our conversation of putting things into a computer and having it spit out the right decision for us at the right time. I, I think, and I think you guys would agree, when we talk about analytics, it's such a broad and misunderstood term today. Uh, especially in sports, the concept, everyone's definition of analytics are always different. What are you most excited about for the future of player evaluations? 
I don't know. I've been I've been thinking about that. Somebody asked me that question uh, a few weeks ago, and and um, there's so much out there, man. And and what our job is, we're really we're not trying to find players. We're trying to eliminate players, right? We have this big pool of of players that we're going through, and we're eliminating guys and and, and trying to find the right ones. And so any piece of um, valuable information that we have, we get excited to really dig into it and test it. Um, but you need some time to, to be able to really look in the graveyard and make sure that it's something that, um, that, that, that is going to be valuable. But um, I've been thinking about that. I don't know. Maybe you can tell me, man, it, it's a, <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there and, and we, we have a very, uh, our staff, not only our scouts, but our coaches, what's really cool here is are always willing to, um, to, to look into things we want to be innovative and, and we want to be in front of the curve and uh you know having covid really taught us some things that that we could do and we were all kind of creatures of habit but they kind of helped us and, and we always want to think forward um and there's a lot of stuff out there man yeah for sure i go ahead Harrison. i was gonna say for the longest time right the nfl has utilize this wonderlick, the IQ, pen and paper, trying to understand how a player processes. But, you know, it doesn't really capture the quick decision-making on-field type of decisions that they have to do. So I'm curious as to your thoughts on the approach of understanding a player's IQ versus his uh, football decision-making ability, and if there's overlap or what your thoughts are on it. Well, yeah, it's different because we, we've all been in situations where we can spend time with a player in a classroom and and you already you go through the process with the coaches and they talk about how smart the player is. And and again, he can have high test scores and everything he does um, and, and, and the written test. And then we spend time with him in a meeting room and he's great on the board. But can you take it from the board and transition it to the field? Sometimes he can't. And sometimes vice versa. Sometimes we see the opposite. We see players that might not score well on certain tests and they might struggle, particularly in the classroom, saying exactly what they're doing. But they get on the field and they have an instinctual quality and, and, and they, they're making the good, the right decisions and they, they just have a knack. They have a nose for the ball. They, they have a feel for it. And it's just a lot more natural. So we, we see that all the time. Um, so you can't just look at, um, a particular test score or take a player off your board because he struggles in a meeting room or you can't just say, hey, this player did well in the meeting room. He's going to be great. Here you go, coaches. He's going to be great. He, he's smart. And and then <laughs> That's right. so you can't do that because um, th- there's a different factor to that. It, it, it's you can't just say, hey, this player is is smart. OK, he can be book smart and he can be smart in the classroom. But transitioning that to the field is different. Yeah, I didn't know, um, Terry, was there anything before we get into the last segment of our uh, of our podcast? Is there anything you'd like to promote? I don't know if Peter Millar, do they, they give you a little uh, snippet or? No. What's I that? You P- I thought you were a Peter Millar guy. Are you not? What is Peter Millar? Wait, is it Orvis? What was the store we were talking about that you love to shop at? Down down oh, at the yeah, yeah, I, I do. Oh, I got you. I got you. Yeah, no doubt. I, I was. I'm in football mode, man. I didn't know we were in clothing <laughs> mode right now. But I swear, I have follow. been shopping I at tracks. that. I have been shopping at that store a lot, but I don't know if that's. Uh, I might get in trouble for saying that, man. I don't know if I'm. <laughs> you know, I I wear a lot of Lululemon. I wear. Uh, you know, obviously the league is is Nike, so I don't know if I can talk about it, man. <laughs> it's all. It's only three beers deep at uh, the combine. You're gonna can get we, me in can trouble. Can we start talking shopping? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you remember that? I, I remember that, man. Oh yeah, oh yeah, totally. Oh yeah, that's, that's awesome. good stuff. Yeah. So, is there anything you do actually want to promote outside of clothing? Then, not really, man. Not really. I'm, um, you know, I'm just here trying to. Uh, do, we got a little bit of the summer left. I got a few days left of the summer, so we're just um, trying to spend a little, spend a little more time with the family. Baseball is kind of taking over our summer. Um, once your son gets older and starts playing travel baseball, it's going to rule your summer between that, between (laughs) cheerleading, it kind of, it's kind of ruled our life, man. That's why me and my wife kind of, um, we escaped and, uh, came out to Buckhead to stay, um, away from the family just for a couple of days. 
That's and nice. um, just to get a little break because they've been dominating our summer, man. So we're trying to soak up as much of the break as we can before we uh, get back in the race. Yeah, that's sacrifice, awesome. Man. Before we get in this last section, Terry, I just want to say, man, it's been a real pleasure to watch you operate. Uh, you know, we've known each other now for almost 10 years and just watching you operate, watching you climb the ladder, watching you do so well has just been so much fun. And uh, we're really, we're really proud of everything you've, you've accomplished, man. Man, that, that means a lot. And, and obviously um, we've known each other for a while and I read every article you guys put out because it's, um, it, it's, it's thought provoking, really. It, it, it's exciting to go through that because it's not like a math equation that we can just figure out. We're, we're constantly um, trying to work to learn more and more. And, and you guys are um, definitely take, taking steps towards that. So um, I always appreciate the, the way y'all think. And, um, and uh, I know we've had a relationship for a long time and we'll continue that. Thanks, man. Appreciate That's it. awesome, man. That's awesome. So uh, you ready to go? Ready, I'm ready man. Funny? All right. <laughs> this, is, this is some football mode, but not necessarily. Okay. Okay. All right, so D- being a DB, it's fourth and goal. You're, uh, you guys are up five, time second on the clock. They snap the football in the hole. You get to meet Bo Jackson, Walter Payton, or the Fridge. Who, wow. who, would, you, who would you rather tackle in that moment to win the game for your Man. team? Well, it, it, it's, it's a tough one because they're obviously going to score the touchdown, either one of them, <laughs> and, and, and we're going to lose the game. <laughs> um, but I would probably say, I'd probably say sweetness just so I could get his autograph afterwards <laughs> after, and maybe, maybe he would, where I know fridge and Bo would run over me. Um, maybe he would jump over me or do something graceful. And then, so I wouldn't get be as bruised up and I'd be able to get his <laughs> autograph uh, after the game. Gotta stay low, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> low man wins even on the fridge. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, who is the meanest player on the field, but then off the field, they're the nicest human being possible. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's Lee Smith. So he's, I mean, for a long time, he was, he's a dirt bag on the field. Right. And and he's one of the better blocking tight ends in the league for a long time. And so getting to spend time with him this year, it, it was funny because our kids lived in the same, um, we lived in the same area. So they went to the same school my son played football with his son, um, his 10 year old son. And so we'd be at practice and, and he's a, uh, you know, like we said, it's a, it's a um, podcast that, that, that we're not, it, it, we're not going to say bad words or anything. So I'm not going to say what he says and what he does on the field, but he goes right from that. And we would, it, it'd be after practice and I finish up some work upstairs and I go down to watch football practice for our kids. Um, the 10 year olds down the street at the park, and he's he's in a lawn chair with all the wives holding court and making them laugh. And, <laughs> and he's just a great guy off the field. So uh, he, he definitely has a switch and, and he was a dirtbag on the field. But, um, man, really good dad and really good family guy. And uh, he, he definitely flipped the switch. That is awesome. Uh, last question. The most impressive player, because you've watched a lot of practices over your over your tenure and your career. Who is the most impressive player that you've ever seen during any of your stops in the NFL? I would say it wasn't a practice and it wasn't a player that was on a, a team that I was working for. We played against the Washington Redskins. I forget the year, but I remember the game like it was yesterday. And Sean Taylor, man, that guy, I, I gave him a grade. So the, the highest grade you can give a player is blue, but you don't give out very many blues. And, and that's, that's elite, all pro. That's you don't give out many blues. Red is Pro Bowl, one of the be- better players in the league at his position. So I gave him a red grade. I, I was a, an advanced scout at that time. I had advanced to Redskins, and I gave Sean Taylor a red grade. That's a good grade. And after about two, three plays, I said I graded him too low. He was unbelievable. Just the way he ran. We talk about instincts and the way he he processed on the field, and and he had a knack, and he would. <laughs> I think that was him right there. I just heard him. He would literally <laughs> run through a wall. But but that guy was was special, um, and, and he took over that game, and he was the best player on the field on that day, and I felt like I had graded him too low. <laughs> That's wild. Totally a good player. 
Yeah, he was unbelievable. Well, Terry, man, we really appreciate your time today joining us. Talking football, talking S2 cognition, your path, everything forward. Man, you're such a good dude. We appreciate your time today. Thanks, guys. I'll do it anytime. I appreciate y'all.